power. Let's stand and sing our opening songs of praise. <laughs> to be faithful and just and forgiving of our sins as we confess them to him. Trusting in his loving promise to forgive, we confess together. With humble and penitent hearts, we come before you seeking your mercy and forgiveness. We recognize that we have not loved you with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind. Our hearts are easily filled with the desires of this world, our souls often go too long without the nourishment of your word, and our minds wander to not think of those things that are noble and pure. We recognize that we have not loved others as well as we have loved ourselves. We are impatient, unkind, unforgiving, and can harbor grudges against those you've placed in our lives. Recognizing our unworthiness and need for forgiveness, we plead, Lord, have mercy on me as sinner.
loving to all who confess with a sincere heart. In his love, he does not treat us as our sins deserve, but rather welcomes us with open arms. In view of God's mercy and by his command, I forgive you all your sins in the name of our loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Almighty Lord God, it was your love for the world, which included each one of us, that moved you to send Jesus to show the greatest act of love to each of us by his life, death, and resurrection. May your love for us settle deep in our hearts, that your love may freely flow from us to others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. first lesson this morning from the prophet Jeremiah and here we see the call that God extended to Jeremiah in his love God had set Jeremiah for a part for a special role in serving serving the Lord and speaking yes messages of sin and condemnation but yes also those messages of God's love and forgiveness although Jeremiah had hesitation the Lord took away his fears by putting his very words in the mouth of Jeremiah beginning at verse 4 of chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson from the Gospel of Luke continues where we finished yesterday, last week where Jesus stood in the temple, in the synagogue reading from the prophet Isaiah and proclaim that these words from Isaiah he fulfilled and the reaction of the people was certainly amazed at what Jesus had to say but then as he uh, recognized that the people in Nazareth would not accept him and receive him as a prophet from their own town it did not deter Jesus in his ministry and his teaching but rather he moved on with his plan of salvation as his father had outlined for him for our benefit. Then Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? they asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard you did in Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah did not send 
what was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath began to teach the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. This is the gospel of the Lord. We'll continue our worship with the singing of the hymn, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus. This is a melody that many of you are familiar with, the song that also has the same melody as Thy Strong Word. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that by your grace in eternity you thought of us and loved us enough to carry out your plan in time to send your Son to be our Savior. We are grateful and thankful for the love that you have shown us. As we are reminded of that love, may the love that we respond in towards you and toward each other may model and mimic the love you have shown for us. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord. Amen. I invite you all to take out a Bible, open to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, as well as take out your message notes on the pink insert, which you can follow along with today's message. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ who have experienced and know the deep, deep love of Jesus. As I mentioned, we start off the worship service, the introduction to it, to the title, What's Love Got to Do With It? 
Maybe some of you are more familiar with that vintage of music than I am, but it's certainly one from the early 80s that has popularity and people still sing today in the 2000s. And reading through the lyrics, I'm not sure what was behind Tina Turner's writing of that song, but to me it seemed like it was one who was somewhat jilted by love and simply considered love a sweet old-fashioned notion. Something from a bygone era, at least as it was intended to be. The term love is a word that maybe has many definitions and is used quite frequently. Oftentimes at weddings, and I have preached on this text, 1 Corinthians 13, to a couple of couples. The one that stands out in my mind is from the movie The Princess Bride. If any of you have seen that at the end, as they're getting married and the priest stands before him and says something to the effect of love, true love. What is true love? What is love for that matter? How would you define it? An emotion? The warm fuzzies I have when for the first time I told my boyfriend or girlfriend at the time, I love you. Is it that word that expresses commitment to your marriage and relationship as you continue to say, I love you, in the context of your marriage? Is it a term that defines endearment as you tell your children or your children say to your parents, I love you? Is love a strong desire for something? such as chocolate. What is love? And what's love got to do with it? When we look at the scripture from 1 Corinthians 13, the term of love is certainly not something that is unique to this chapter of the scripture. Although the term love, and if you'd ask, take a poll of people, say, where does the Bible talk about love? If people are familiar with this chapter, they'll probably say, well, 1 Corinthians 13, isn't that the love chapter? Printed on many plaques you can buy in Christian stores and other, other places, especially verses 4 to 7, love is patient, kind, etc. The people might define and understand love as the Bible speaks of it based on 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And it's certainly not just the central focus of this chapter of the Bible, but really the central focus of all of Scripture. I did simply a search on my Bible software and typed in love, and the, just the term love comes up 500 plus times. I think it goes sort through how many times does that talk about God's love for us or our love for him or our love for each other. But just the sheer amount of time that that word is used in the Scripture tells me that it's an important and central concept of the scripture. And so today we want to understand what does love have to do with us, with our life, that we might understand love as God defines it and how God has shown it and how love is expressed by us to one another. To help us do that, we will look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and just Briefly, by way of introduction, most of us, again, think of this as a wedding passage. But if you look at the chapter before and after, Paul's not in, the, he's not in a wedding service. One of the members didn't come up to him and say, uh, Paul, can you preach at my sermon? He says, okay, I got it. Here's your message. Love is patient, love is kind, etc. This isn't a wedding sermon by Paul. And if you glance at chapter 12 that we looked at last week, what is he talking about? Spiritual gifts and the body of Christ. How each one is uniquely gifted but unified around Christ and serving our head, that is Christ. Recognizing that we all have differences in that which as God has gifted us, different spiritual gifts, but that same unity 
In chapter 13, is Rao really getting at what, what is the spirit, what is the attitude with which I go about serving in the body of Christ? How do I use the gifts God has given me to benefit not just myself, but the people around me, and to also glorify the Lord? And as Paul's helping us understand that concept, he focuses on the teaching of love. For if I do anything without love, in general, but specifically in the church of God, as you'll see, I'm just a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. Let's see what Paul has to say through inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God also speaking to us this morning. I'm going to start just at the end of chapter 12, the beginning of the paragraph. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. And where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappear. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Taking in, in order the paragraphs that Paul pens it and puts it before us, looking at those first three verses, what's the first point that Paul is teaching us about love? The point is, love makes all I do pleasing to God and a blessing to others. Love makes all I do pleasing to God and a blessing to others. You've heard our band play together this morning. Sounds pretty good. Cohesive unit. But if all of a sudden, Roger just started banging a different beat on the drums, he might have a song in mind that he's playing a tune to and he's playing his beat, and the rest of us start going. And you see Roger's really into it and playing the best drums he's ever played. But who is he benefiting? In his own spirit, he might be worshiping the Lord and playing a joyful noise to the Lord. But for the rest of us, what does it sound like? A resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. If one of the guitarist players did the same and all of a sudden you see their eyes closed and they're jamming out on their guitar, playing their own thing and say, what are you doing? And say, I'm praising the Lord. And they say, well, that's great, but it sounds like a mess to us. See what Paul's getting at? He says, I can have all these spiritual gifts, which in and of themselves are blessings from God. I can have the gift of prophecy. I can fathom all mysteries, all knowledge, have faith that can move mountains. But what does he say? I have all those gifts, but don't use them in the spirit of love for the people around me. I'm a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. You see, resounding gongs and clanging cymbals can be making racket in God's church when we operate independently. We don't consider the needs and the benefit of others. Paul said elsewhere, I'd rather speak one intelligible word that builds up and edifies God's people than many in a tongue. He said, the tongue will benefit me and edify me personally, but I'd rather benefit and build up the church of God. And so it is, if you go back to that context of the body of Christ, if God has gifted me and given me a talent, I can go out and use it myself and I can enjoy this relationship with God and be glorifying God in, in what I do individually. 
but it's not fitting into the whole that God has designed us to be unified around the love of Christ, to serve Christ and to serve the people around us. And so we can have a very strong faith and have great gifts that God has given us. But if our heart is not driven by the love of God for us and the love for our fellow believers in the body of Christ, we're a resounding gong. I can be very active for the Lord and create a spiritual clanging. Paul says, love is the key element. We'll get to the definition in a minute. And that's why he says, I want to show you the most excellent way. What is that excellent way? To exhibit the love of Christ in all we do and to exhibit the love for others in all we do. Notice who's not in there. Focus on me. And how easily that can creep into the church of God, especially if we have been given a strong faith and have been given special gifts by God's Spirit that Satan loves to want us to draw the attention to ourselves rather than for the building up of God's people and for showing the love of Christ to God's people. Love makes all I do pleasing to God and a blessing to others. Now Paul is going to define love for us. The point in these verses, verses 4 to 7 and the first part of verse 8, is notice that love is defined by what it does, not what it is. And that's true throughout Scripture. If we're looking for what love is, and, and it's a vague concept in many ways as to how to put in a nice, concise, concise statement, what is love? Because it does have an emotional aspect to it. It does have a committed aspect to it. But more often than not, in the Scripture, love is defined by what it does and what it is. And if you look at those, those three or four verses, verses 4 through 7, and on your sheet, I said, box the part of the definition that indicate what love does. Underline those things that define what love doesn't do. And if you just go through that, I put it up on the board, and you can maybe it's got too many lines for you to, to understand, but just to, to notice how God, through inspiration, through the Apostle Paul, helps us understand and define what love is by what it does and what it doesn't do versus just here's what love is. He goes through the list. We could spend a whole sermon on each one of these, but we won't. Love is patient. This is what love does. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love keeps no records of, of wrong. Love rejoices in the truth. Love protects. Love trusts. Love hopes. Love perseveres. Love doesn't envy. Doesn't boast. Is not proud. Is not rude. Is not self-seeking. Is not easily angered. It does not delight in evil. See, what Paul is saying is here's Here's how God's body parts interact. Here's how God's people interact with one another. And if you look at any of these attributes, you can just pick out one or two and ask yourself the question, how did God first show this attribute to me? You could make, you could make a case for each one of these. Love is patient. God does not treat us as our sins deserve. How many times should I forgive my brother? Jesus said, and I tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven. Why is that? Because that same forgiveness is the same patient forgiveness that God has shown to us. Love is patient. Love is kind. God extends his mercies day after day. Gives us his goodness and food to eat and clothing to wear and a shelter over our head. Does not envy. It does not boast. God's people don't say, like we talked about last week, I wish I was like so-and-so. I wish I had the gifts of so-and-so. And then if someone is gifted, and say, well, look at me. Look at what God has given to me. Love doesn't do that. Love has its focus on Christ and his love for us and serving one another. Love forgives, doesn't keep a tally of wrongs. Love doesn't have its own personal agenda. Love isn't in this for itself. Love protects the reputation of others. Love shares and enjoys the truth that doesn't oogle over evil and what evil does. Love reaches out. 
Love is defined by what it does, not necessarily what it is. Verse 8, love never fails. I'm going to save the piece of that explanation to the end. Verse 13 says the greatest of these is love. I'll give you a hint that the two are connected. This is what love is. This is a value we hold as members of Tree of Life in general as God's people to deal with each other in love. Understanding, first of all, the love of God that he has shown to us that we might exhibit that love for one another. And that's what Paul gets into now in the third part of this chapter. Love is the greatest because of its source. We don't have an explanation in chapter 13 as to the source of what this love is, but we certainly know from the broader piece of, of context and the broader framework of Scripture and even the letter to 1 Corinthians of what this love is that God, that, that Paul is talking about. And it's interesting as he goes through these, remember how he started off by speaking in tongues, etc. He says, you know what? Where there are prophecies, those are going to end. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. What is he talking about? God has given us these gifts to be little snippets of benefit in our Christian life and to benefit one another, but they're going to pass away. And God has given them that we might have a glimpse of what is to come. In verse 12, we see a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And as we grow up, we use that analogy of a child. There are things that I think about and the things I do as a child that I don't do as an adult. Why? It's because I, I mature when I grow up. At least I hope we do. When I was like a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child. What is, what is Paul getting at? He says that when we're going to fully understand what love is, is when we see Jesus face to face. Then we will know fully this concept of love. Why? Because we'll see face to face the source of this love. But before we get to that point, we don't say, well, I, I guess I can't love because I haven't seen Jesus face to face. That's why the scriptures are here to point us to the love of God that he's shown to us in Christ. Because we cannot truly love we cannot truly love God or love each other until we know and experience and have the love of Christ. For that is perfect love. That is love that never fails. That is love that has been there from the beginning. That is why John wrote in his first epistle, his first letter, we love because he first loved us. Sure, we can have nice thoughts and nice words toward one another, but it's until the heart has experienced the love of God that heart cannot truly love. And that's why Paul says, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Have you ever gotten to that verse and said, why, why is that? I mean, faith is a great thing, right? It's what we hold on to and it's the trust that God has forgiven us in Christ and that eternal life is ours hope is a great thing so we don't we don't mourn as one without hope but we we have a certain hope that we know where we're headed because of Christ we have something in the future that is not a, well I hope it doesn't rain this afternoon but it's a certainty that God has promised us as he brought us into his family through baptism and keeps us in his family through the word and through the sacraments these two are great things, aren't they? Faith and hope. Well, Paul doesn't say these are worthless. They are great things. He says the greatest of these three is love. Why is that? I wouldn't have the first two except for the last. Do you know what I mean? I wouldn't have faith except the love of God provided it to me. 
I would have no hope except the love of God in eternity acted on my behalf. It is not our love for one another that Paul says the greatest of these is love. But capturing the whole concept of Scripture and the love of God for us, the reason that love is the greatest is because it is the foundation upon which God interacts with his people. And it's the foundation upon which faith is built and produces fruits of faith. And it's the foundation upon which hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, Christ's love. And as we marvel at this concept of love, we can't help but go back and say, what are all the ways that God has loved us? And maybe we start by saying, you know, as I look at 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7, I simply apply it maybe in our marriage or in my interaction with my children or vice versa, or interaction with another. Boy, there are times that I have not been patient. I have not been kind. I, I have been envious and I've been boastful. I've been pride, proudful in my own accomplishments, my own doing. I've been rude and I've been self-seeking. I've been easily angered. I, I keep a list of wrongs and I delight in seeing what evil does and I, and I stray away from the truth and it, I don't always protect and I, and I don't always trust and I, and I certainly don't always hope and I certainly give up at times. I go through that list of what love is and what a failure, what a wretched person I am. And then God says, I keep no record of wrongs. My love for you took those to the cross and said where you were imperfect in your love for me and for each other, when you did not love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and you did not love your neighbor as yourself, God could have said, you know what, I only gave you one simple command and that was to love and you messed up. But he does not treat us as our sins deserve. And like the waiting father of the prodigal son, he welcomes us back with open arms. He says, you're my son. You're my daughter. I love you. You're mine. But, but Father, what about all these things? He said, I'm taken care of. Paid for. The blood of my son. Paid for you. But don't, Father, don't I, have to, don't I have to do something? I mean, I want to give, I want to, I want to make sure that, no. This is my love for you. It's my gift. Are you sure? Yes. I'm sure. How do I know? Were you baptized? You know, when I was whatever age. You know the water and the word that was there? That's when my love said, you're one of mine. Yeah, but I don't remember that, Lord. Well, did you go to the Lord's Supper last week? Yeah, I did. Partake of my body and blood. Do you remember what was said? Given and shed for you the forgiveness of sins. Have you opened my word recently? Seen what is written there? For God so loved the world. Who's part of the world? Um, I am, Father. Then I loved you. You are mine. This is God's love for us. And we could list many more. <coughs> the amazing thing is, is, if this is just the reflection, what an awesome thing. 
to face the reality. To see that which brought us love face to face. Love is certainly not a sweet, old-fashioned notion. But it is eternal reality. What does love have to do with it? What does love have to do with you? With your life? Eternal life? I don't think it would be any surprise to any of us to answer that question. God's love has everything to do with it. Amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus now and to eternity. Amen. We'll join in making confession of our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. They're printed on page 4 your worship folder. Please stand. <coughs> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I'll be gathering an offering for the Lord's work and sharing his word abroad. We'll also I'll be passing out the friendship registers. And then uh, for the prayer of the church, as we've done... Uh, Previous Sundays when we have our contemporary worship, um, we'll have uh, some index cards. And John and Roger, when you're, when you're done with the friendship registers, there's some index cards. And maybe uh, someone else can jump up and grab those. If you have a prayer request you'd like to include in uh, today's prayer of the church, if you don't have a pen, just ask them to pass that friendship register back and use the one that's... Uh, oh, they already got the card, so already on top of it. Just uh, hand a few down. And uh, if someone wants to use them, do so. If not, just put them at the end of the, the pew.
please stand for prayer. Almighty Lord, we thank and praise you for the opportunity to gather to worship you this morning. It's something we take for granted, but also remember as a blessed privilege we have as citizens of this country. We thank you for the tireless effort of our men and women who have, who have and are serving in the armed forces to preserve this and many other freedoms. Especially this morning, we thank you for our sister in the faith, Sherry Eliason, who is once again deployed and serving us in Afghanistan. Circle her with your angels during her time of active duty. Be with Steve, Sean, and Todd as she is away to calm their hearts. According to your goodwill, bring them safely back together again in May. Lord, we thank you for the gift of marriage and the bond of love that you bring between a husband and wife. We thank you for the opportunity to strengthen 18 marriages yesterday at our Friends for Life seminar in Winston-Salem. We pray that these and all our marriages would be guided by your love for us so that we might always show the same love to our spouse. Protect our marriages from the divisiveness Satan loves to bring and keep them united with a common focus in you and frequent forgiveness for one another. Lord, we come to you on behalf of those who are sick or ailing or recovering from an ailment. We thank you for Rob Englander's recovery from his chemotherapy that appears that that has done its work in his body to clear his body from cancer. We praise and thank you for your healing power. We ask you to be with those that, especially this Vivacic family, as they continue their recovery and support of one another. For Peter Zilkowski to heal him and his ailment, may they see your glory and their weakness, and may this be a time for them and all of us to rely more deeply on you. We also pray for Jackie, who has bone cancer. The Lord would relieve her of her pain and find treatment that heals her body as well. Lord, you have seen fit in the past week to take some to their home of glory, and we praise and thank you for the love that you have shown to us that they might have the same comfort of your love. Pray for the Brogdon family, whose mom and wife, Stephanie, died suddenly, leaving behind a husband and three small children. Lord, we just ask that you would surround them with your love and people who know your love that can share that with them in this time of grieving and unexpected loss. We also pray for the family of Werner Rosenbaum, who you called home last night, a member of St. Paul's in Saginaw. Again, comfort these families with your life-giving word and the hope and promise of the resurrection. And Lord, as we have opportunity to know and experience your love, we ask that you would use us in a powerful way to step outside our comfort zones at times, to use our gifts and talents to love and serve each other and serve the community of, around us for the reason of sharing your love with other people who do not yet know your love. Use us, Lord, each individually to interact and converse with an individual that we might be your spokesperson to share the love of Christ, that they too might have hope and faith and realize that the greatest is your love for them. Lord, we thank you for this privilege to come to you in prayer and pray together the prayer you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You may be seated for the singing of the closing hymns, first of all, Fear Not, and then Your Everlasting Love.
Good morning and welcome to all. And it's great to have you all with us. And uh, I do, and it's been fun to work with uh, the talent that's in our group and um, share that with you. And, and uh, we appreciate you learning a few new things uh, with us today. You have the schedule for the week uh, printed out in your, your pink insert. You have another opportunity for uh, fellowship and music tomorrow night. Uh, Chris Driesbach will be here from New Orleans. Be a, a light dinner provided. If you have not signed up, uh, did not sign up last week, please uh, speak to Pat Stolpa uh, today or leave a note on her desk in the office that you and however many else will be attending. Certainly all are invited to that. We'll enjoy that uh, evening together. The rest of the schedule you have there are a few things in the upcoming weeks. Um, we'll ha have more details as the, the, the teen group, five of our teens and one chaperone, uh, Heather Oganowski, are going to be headed to Dallas in July for the Wells International Youth Rally, which I'm really excited about for their sake and the opportunity for them to fellowship with other uh, brothers and sisters and their peer group uh, from around our synod and around the world. And to assist them in that, they'll be providing different uh, service act activities and opportunities. To, uh, the cost to attend is $300 plus we're figuring probably about $300 for transportation uh, to get there. So about $600 per uh, student to attend. Um, so the different opportunities you'll be seeing um, are an effort on their part to put those dollars together to attend the rally. And uh, I'm looking forward to individually and, and also us collectively as a congregation supporting them in doing that. And the first one that's on the calendar, uh, February 16th is a Friday night those that desire to uh, take your valentine out for an evening but have uh, little sweethearts that uh, you don't want to take along with you, particularly that night, um, the, the teen group will be here providing uh, babysitting for a suggested donation price, again, to uh, help them in their effort to uh, make it to destination Dallas. So you have a little bit more information on that, and they'll, like I said, there'll be different opportunities that they'll be presenting to us as a congregation to assist them in getting there. I think the other things you are able to read on your own. Other things that need to be spoken publicly this morning. Carlene. Heather. 